fact, I was discussing this with someone this morning, so the serendipity is marvelous. He came to me and he said, look, he had been looking into I Newton. He's not a professional scientist. And he realized that Newton spent a good part of his life trying to figure out when the next comet is going to hit the Earth, which he calculated as something like 2062, whatever. But imagine what this means, translated into Velikovskian terms. Newton had been using ancient mythology, particularly the Old Testament, which he believed was true evidence written down by people who weren't scientists and made it into mythology, but it was evidence that a giant comet had come to the Earth not that long ago. So he was doing the same work as Velikovsky. And he was even waiting or trying to calculate when the next comet is going to come because he figured there's a periodicity to it. Now, if you think of Newton, as I mentioned yesterday in one of the responses to one of the questions, he has been idealized as the perfect scientist. In other words, absolutely objective, absolutely disinterested, does not allow any thought of God or deity or supernatural intervention to come into life, and he's the, the paradigm of the perfect secular scientist. Well, he's not. Newton believed actively in God. He believed that God had created the world. He had created like a clockwork. He had ordained the laws of nature by which the clockwork would run, and that God had made and invented and created everything in re what we call reality. So Newton was a believer in God. You know, he believed that sometimes the world went a little haywire, and he had to step in and tweak the clock a little bit, which means he may not have been a perfect clockmaker because his clock needed a little adjustment every now and then. There were, this is called deism, but there were other deists who actually believed that God never had to intervene. He made a perfect clock and then he went away and played golf or something while the world ran by itself because the clock was perfect. My argument is that everything has to run according to natural law. If it didn't, it would be random. Water would flow uphill and the sun would come up in the morning, in the evening, and you know, things like that. So there is natural law and everything in the world runs according to natural law. But natural law does not mean uniformitarianism. It means that every once in a while the world goes haywire and there are huge cataclysms. And this is all built into the clock. The clock sometimes does this and sometimes does that. Newtonian view of the world came out of a culture where they wanted everyone to behave like a British gentleman, meaning nothing violent, nothing excessive. It was, I defined it as a tea-sipping vision of the world, you know, with your pinky in the air. And they also wanted the universe to sip tea. In other words, they developed a theory which was a tea-sipping theory of the universe as a large British gentleman. And my argument was, the apple does not fall far from the tree, or in plain common sense, the plant must reflect the soil out of which it grows. It cannot go completely against the nurture that nature has provided it. And therefore, that the Newtonian theory was really a new form of religion. Aristotelianism, which people had believed in for 2,000 years, was in effect a religion that I, I gave myself the role of a skeptical man from Mars. I come down and I meet an earthling and I say, show me what you believe in, show me things about your culture. And he tells me all about Aristotle and he says, we believed it for 2,000 years. And I say to him, my dear fellow, my dear earthling, can you not see that this is merely a secularized form of religion? Because what religion gives you, as far as I 
look at it from a utilitarian point of view is that it, three things, it tells you how the world works, it tells you who's in charge and that he's really benevolent, and it tells you that he likes you and you can connect with him. So the bottom line message of our Aristotle as a religion was don't worry. Don't worry, there may be enormous cataclysms and in the time of the Greeks there were huge volcanoes and earthquakes and so on, but Aristotle says don't worry because the prime mover who is the guiding force of the universe likes you and he likes you in particular. You have a friend up there, you see? And that Newton simply came along with a more mechanized but ultimately similar vision of the world. I think this is the same thing here, that we are in a period where Velikovsky could be looked at as a heretic. They called him a crank and a pseudoscientist and a crackpot and so on and so on. But I think it's much better to look upon him as a whistleblower because everybody can understand that. The whistleblower leaks the secret that the picture that the large, dominant, powerful organization is trying to give the world is not true, that there is an other truth going on. So Velikovsky was a whistleblower, and we know what has happened to a lot of whistleblowers in the last... There are now laws protecting whistleblowers and so on, because some of them suffered, and Velikovsky suffered as a whistleblower. But if you believe his picture of how the world works, which I believe, then you see everything in a different light. The whole world changes for you as it did for me. It's like somebody meeting Jesus and he's transformed, you see. It is a kind of religious, with a small r, transformation. Because you see the world differently and all of a sudden, everything I look at, I say, hey, can I in interpret this in a different way? One day I saw a famous Christmas movie called White Christmas, made about 50 or 60 years ago. They show it every year at Christmas time. It's got Danny Kaye and Bing Crosby and so on. And if you interpret it in terms of Velikovsky, you see what's really going on. Uh, the movie starts in Miami, which is a code word for the hottest south. It then moves up to Vermont, which is Hollywood's code for the furthest north. And these two men who are like uh, mythological brothers, because one of them saved the other's life, they're going to put on a show up there, but there's no snow. So the cycles are not working properly. And they find out that the owner of the hotel is their old general, which means he's the old god that used to rule the universe before, but he can't make it happen now. And so the whole movie is about bringing back the normal cycle of the seasons and saying goodbye, burying with kindness the old god, which is the old general. And they all get together in their old uniforms and they sing him a song and then off he goes. So to me, it's very Velikovskian. I don't know if anybody else in history has ever analyzed the movie that way. I gave an example yesterday, if you remember, about the game of baseball. Now, in Egyptian mythology, the boat of the god Ra must make its circle. Everything in the universe is solid orbits, which are never disturbed. So whenever we saw in the sky the orbits being disturbed, all hell descended on Earth. Now, the, the god Ra, if he can sail his boat and keep it going, then Egypt is secure and the whole world is secure. But he has an enemy who has different names, but in this world, in this particular story, the enemy is called Apophis. And Apophis 
sends projectiles against the boat and tries to stop it. Now, there are inscriptions, not inscriptions, but carved pictures in Egypt of the f different pharaohs like Thutmose III, who is standing there with a stick and he says to the goddess Hathor, or whoever, behold, I have driven off the evil eye of Apophis so that the boat of the god Ra can continue. Now the evil eye is the form of a ball and he is holding in his shoulder a stick. Now if you think of a game where you hit a ball with a stick, it's baseball. And the whole point of the baseball field, which is called a diamond because it's shaped that way, but the whole point is to get the runners to circle, not run at angles, but to circle the bases, which means to complete an orbit. So if you have, I don't know how much you understand baseball, but if you have something called a pitcher's duel, where the pitchers are so good the batters just can't get a hit, imagine everybody who comes up strikes out. Well, if they keep striking out, the game will go on forever. It'll never end because nobody ever gets a hit. All we have is strikeouts. Nobody even gets the first base. But if you hit the ball and you knock it away so you can get to first base, or if you hit a home run, you go to all four, then you complete an orbit and you win the game and the world is safe. So I ask the audience to imagine a photograph of Babe Ruth with a bat on his shoulder a photograph of W.G. Grace, who was the greatest cricketer in history in England, late 19th century with a long beard, with a bat on his shoulder, and then compare that to these paintings, wall paintings in Egypt, of Thutmotis with the stick on his shoulder, behold, I have driven off the evil eye. You recognize what's going on behind baseball. You see? So that's the way I decode sport, great art, all sorts of uh, soap operas, all sorts of products of popular culture.